Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the Ensuring Equity in Aging webinar series. Uh, today, we're focused on culturally informed policy and programs with and for Latino older adults. Uh, just a couple of reminders, we do have closed captioning available through Zoom. You should be able to toggle on the uh, text using the toolbar. Um, American Sign Language is also available and slides. The recording and transcripts will be posted to CDA's California for All Aging, Ages Equity and Aging Resource Center and the YouTube channel. Um, we will have a Q&A section for the last 10 minutes of the webinar. Uh, I do encourage folks that are on, if you have questions that come to you as you're hearing presentations, to use the Q&A box um, on your toolbar to submit questions throughout the webinar, and at the end, we'll uh, address as many as we can with our speakers. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Connie. Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Connie Nakano. I'm the Assistant Director of Communications with the California Department of Aging. So I wanted to welcome everyone and thank you all for joining. Um, so today's uh, webinar, Ensuring Equity in Aging uh, webinar series, um, this happens the first Wednesday of each month. Um, and uh, this uh, features state and local speakers with expertise in subjects of cultural competency, equity, program, and service delivery. Um, so our goal is to learn together and how we can help make our communities uh, more of a place and also build a California for all. Next month's webinar uh, will be on May 5th. Um, it's culturally informed policy and programs with and for older adults with Alzheimer's and other dementias. We'll have more details to come, so be sure to register in advance. A little bit about today's speakers. Um, so today we have uh, Carlos Londano, uh, Anna Seta, and Dr. Jeffrey Reynoso. Um, a little bit about uh, Carlos. Um, Carlos is a community health specialist for the Alzheimer's Association, Northern California and Northern Nevada chapter, where he works on health education and community outreach programs with the Latino community. Mr. Londano has a longstanding professional interest in health promotion and prevention. He is currently focused on engaging Latino families in promoting healthy aging, brain health, early detection of cognitive diseases, and supporting families facing Alzheimer's disease and dementias. In addition to his work with Alzheimer's Association, Carlos is a commissioner on the Alameda County Advisory Committee on Aging and recently joined Harvard's um, Tiburcio Vasquez Health Center's Board of Directors. Dr. Jeffrey Winoso is the executive director of the Latino Coalition for a Healthy California, a leading policy organization advocating for health equity of the Latino community. In his role, he is responsible for strategic leadership and external relations, fundraising and financial management, organizational development of staff and board, and delivering on policy advocacy and programmatic initiatives. Dr. Reynoso has over a decade of experience working on health equity and social justice issues spanning academia, government, and nonprofit sectors at the local, state, and national levels. Most recently, he worked at Kaiser Permanente designing innovative programs to address food insecurity in the Southern California region. Anna Gonzalez Seda is the Director of Programs for the San Diego Imperial Chapter for the Alzheimer's Association where she oversees the care and support arm of the local chapter. Prior to this, Anna worked in the nonprofit sector for various leading health organizations in the San Diego area for over 25 years. In addition to her role with the Alzheimer's Association, she sits on the Health Equity Adv Advisory Committee of the Office of Public Health, as well as various community boards that support quality, affordable housing and living livable neighborhoods. Most recently, Anna became a fellow for the Hispanics Organized for Political Equality, or HOPE, under the Leadership Institute. Now I'll toss it over to Dr. Jeffrey Reynoso. Great, thank you for that introduction. Uh, buenos dias, good morning everyone that's joining us here today as an Equity Advisory Committee member for the Master Plan on Aging. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I was asked to speak about the social, political, and historical context of Latinos in California. So that'll be the focus of my presentation today. Next slide. 
But first, uh, a little bit about LCHC. We are a statewide policy advocacy organization advancing health equity for our lar largest racial ethnic group in California. And our mission is to advance and protect the health of Latinos through policy and advocacy to create healthy communities in California. Next slide. And we do this through three priority strategies. The first is our community programming arm. Our signature initiative is a health ambassadors program. Uh, this is a partnership with the California Department of Social Services, CalFresh Healthy Living Branch, and uh, PHI Center for Wellness and Nutrition. Uh, the focus of the program is to train community leaders. A lot of them are uh, Latina mothers or promotores de salud, uh, and really build their capacity and leadership development around policy systems and environmental change related uh, to food policy in particular. Uh, we also have a range of other programs. Uh, we are currently in the middle of a Zoom listening tour across California of Latino communities. Uh, this year, we're focusing on Orange, LA, San Diego, the Inland Empire, and the Central Valley regions. And we're trying to understand community needs to better develop a post-COVID policy agenda for health equity. Next slide. Our core of, as an organization is policy change. Uh, we bring together cross-sector stakeholders uh, representing different regions, different issue areas across the state to refine our policy agenda on an annual basis at our fall policy summit. Um, that picture on the left was from uh, pre-COVID days, um, the last time we were in person. And uh, through the policy agenda, we start developing and brainstorming with our coalition partners, our policy priorities, which are the specific uh, pieces of legislation uh, that we're co-sponsoring and advancing in the legislature. Um, on the right is our 2021 policy priorities, uh, hot off the presses. Uh, it was released last week, and you can download that from our website if you're interested. The final uh, strategy for our organization, this really came about um, in the under the federal uh, at the federal level under the prior administration. Uh, we uh, in California and nationally saw a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment, and so we launched our communications department. And what we're doing here is advancing narrative change strategies to develop a culture of health, um, a culture that is pro-immigrant, pro-Latino, and really tells the stories of who we are as a community and what our cultural and economic contributions are to the state. Uh, last year, we had a pretty robust get out the vote effort. And uh, this year, we are uh, partnering with the California Department of Social Services and the California Community Foundation to uh, support with the COVID-19 vaccine education and outreach. Next slide. So before we move on, I wanted to ground the conversation in some a couple of definitions and frameworks that you'll see throughout uh, um, not only my presentation, but those of my colleagues. Uh, I wanted to start with the social determinants of health. Uh, this is a definition from the CDC and social determinants of health are the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes. So it, this is everything from access to high quality education, high quality health care, uh, economic stabilities and supports, uh, and is your neighborhood active and do you have um, active transportation available to you, and, um, which we term the built environment, and then the broader social and community context. And this is important uh, because uh, the literature and study after study have shown that 60% of premature death is determined not by access to health care or your individual genetics, by, but by the social, environmental, and behavioral factors. Um, next slide. So uh, this is really uh, critical as we think about like what are the interventions that we need to focus on if we want our communities to be healthy and well. Uh, this particular framework uh, is from BARHI, which is the Bay Area Regional Health Inequities Initiative. It's a member organization of the 11 local public health departments in the Bay Area. And uh, what this, what I, I know there's a lot here, but I'll focus on um, kind of the most upstream, which is the social inequality slide. So for Latinos in particular, uh, immigration status and specifically xenophobia and anti-racist sentiment uh, are drivers of poor health. Um, so those social inequities ultimately impact how we pattern our policies and our systems. And that ultimately impacts how um, we pattern our social determinants, which is that uh, middle box, um, which are the social determinants of health. 
So um, one example um, that I'll walk you through is uh, anti-immigrant sentiment uh, has created a cultural environment in which uh, our legislators haven't necessarily advanced uh, health care access for low-income seniors um, who are undocumented. So still within the state of California, we have been successful in passing progressive legislation in expanding health care access in our state's Medi-Cal program for, uh, for immigrant and specifically undocumented immigrant uh, kids and young adults, but Latinx seniors still don't have access um, to that preventative care. And so that ultimately impacts um, being able to access preventative care. Um, these disparities have of course been ex exacerbated under the COVID-19 pandemic, but this also happens, um, xenophobia and anti-racist sentiment uh, also happen within uh, living conditions in the service delivery environment. So that's um, that middle box under our healthcare sector. If our if our programs in in the social services in the human services space aren't culturally and linguistically informed uh, and and competent, then you're re, um, you're reintroducing inequities into the system, and that ultimately has um, consequences for uh, disease, injury um, downstream, and we ultimately see that in health disparities um, across the life. Course. Um, I also wanted to highlight that this particular framework, while great, um, doesn't necessarily highlight age and disability status, but when we think of aging and healthy aging, ageism and uh, um, anti-disability sentiment um, are definitely social inequities that we need to uh, actively combat um, if we're going to achieve health equity. Next slide. So who are Latinos in California? Um, so I'll run through a couple of statistics to give us a flavor of who we are as a state. Uh, Latinos are the plurality racial ethnic group in California. We represent nearly 40% of 40 million Californians and that's only expected to increase over time. Next slide. There are different terms for Latinos. Um, so Latinos and Latino immigrants, we share a common history in terms of immigration, some, um, some different immigration stat statuses um, across different points of time. Uh, we also share a common history with the United States of a history of colon colonization and slavery. And so we are a multiracial community. Um, but we also um, have changed over time in terms of how we term ourselves. So this is the latest data that um, I could pull from UC Berkeley Institute of Governmental Studies and basically asked let, uh, California Latino voters. So that's already a subset of the population. How do you identify? And what this shows is a lot of variability, right? So the terms Hispanic, Latino or Latina, Latinx, um, they, they all um, register in terms of um, identity. I think two points I'll, I'll share here. Uh, younger Latinos are more likely to identify with Latinx, which is a gender neutral term. Um, older adults are more likely to identify as Hispanic, um, but um, all groups are more likely, are able to identify in different ways depending on, on the audience and, 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 and who they're speaking with. Um, so next slide. Latinos in California are younger compared to other racial ethnic groups in California. 52% of California kids are Latinx and 41% of California millennials are Latinx. Next slide. Approximately 7% of the Latino population is older than 64, and that's in comparison to 18% of the non-Latino population according to the latest data that we have. Um, that, that is to say that while uh, in, in terms of the chart on the right, uh, over time we expect this gap to narrow. Um, you know, I just mentioned in a previous slide that 52% of Latino kids are uh, of kids in California are Latino. So that only uh, if you you know if you look down into the future, uh, we expect that population of Latino seniors to increase. And so this is going to have direct consequences for the demand for services that are multicultural and multilingual to better serve this population. Next slide. Most immigrants in California are Latinx. We are we are a state of immigrants. Twenty seven percent of the state um, of the state of California are immigrants. Uh, Sixty nine percent of California immigrants report speaking English proficient proficiently. Uh, Seventy five percent of California Latinos uh, spoke a language other than English at home. So we are a bilingual um, and a multilingual uh, population. 
Uh, but one point that I'll highlight is 34% of Latinos self-identified as speaking English less than very well. So obviously that has a, a direct consequences for our programming and our service delivery. Uh, and uh, oftentimes we think of not speaking English well means that we um, Latinos may speak Spanish. And while that is the case as as a as a alternate primary language, uh, the Latino community also uh, is represented of multiple indigenous uh, identities and a, a lot of um, a lot of Latinos actually speak an indigenous language as their primary language. So something to consider as we develop our programs. Next slide. 52% of California's immigrant population are naturalized US citizens, 25% are green card holders. So the majority of immigrants in California are, are here through a uh, uh, legal status. Um, but that is to say that California has the largest undocumented population for state in the nation. Um, nearly one in four California's immigrants are undocumented. And so as we think about uh, uh, inclusion and exclusion of um, immigrant communities, this is a really critical point because immigration status still continues to be a barrier and also an opportunity for, for our service delivery and programming. So next slide. And before I hand it over to my colleagues who are gonna do a great job of providing a deep dive into Latinx seniors and service delivery, um, I wanna spend a couple of minutes in the policy and systems level, which is um, uh, where uh, the, the Latino Coalition does a lot of our work. Um, in, in, the, in 1994, California voters passed Proposition 187. Uh, many of you may remember this as the ballot initiative that it had it been stayed in the federal courts would have denied public education, healthcare, and other state services to immigrants who were undocumented. So these were policies of immigrant exclusion. Uh, many have argued that the, the act, activism in response to Prop 187 marked a turning point in California, spurring civic engagement among younger Latinos and creating the beginnings of a pro-immigrant culture in the state. For LCHD, we were you know, in the middle of all of this and we acted as a plaintiff against the state of California, uh, ensuring that all women receive access to prenatal care regardless of immigration status. Mm -hmm. And at the time it preserved prenatal care for over 40,000 low income undocumented women and their children in the state. Next slide. So fast forward to the California of today. Uh, so California is at the forefront of pro-immigrant policy and systems change. Uh, many of the Latino legislators uh, actually participated in activism uh, against Prop 187 and have led the charge in the California state legislator. Um, we've passed um, licenses for undocumented immigrants, decriminalized street vending, and as a state, um, particularly under the prior federal administration, we fought against anti-immigrant policies at a federal level like public charge, uh, which uh, continue to remove um, exclusions of immigrants accessing uh, healthcare and public benefits. Uh, today, we are um, a proud steering committee member of the Health Fraud Coalition, and we have successfully expanded coverage for uh, undocumented kids and young adults. And this legislative cycle, we are actively supporting SB 56 and AB 4 to expand coverage for low income seniors. Next slide. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on this, um, but just to uh, give a flavor in terms of the types of uh, systems level solutions that we see at an organizational level to um, increase um, um, and better serve uh, Latino immigrant communities. So obviously ensuring that materials and uh, the delivery services are bicultural and bilingual and are made with and for uh, Latino communities. We've also seen a uh, huge success uh, across the board with the Promotora or community health model. So um, promotores are uh, bilingual um, kind of cultural brokers between the community and the healthcare system and have been really effective in providing that education and outreach out into the community and ensuring that uh, folks are signed up for the services that they're eligible for, um, but are, are also able to combat that mistrust um, within government and uh, healthcare systems. Uh, we also um, have seen effective strategies with regards to establishing community-based partnerships, also um, being civically engaged and developing the next generation of leaders through engagement in youth empowerment uh, programs and ensuring that um, 
uh, particularly when the health and social services space that Latinos are um, being uh, mentored and being part of that pipeline. And then ultimately for those that work in, in, in that direct service space, being involved in advocacy, um, those voices of direct service providers are so critical. And so we invite you to be a part of advocacy and be a part of whatever issue that you're passionate about. Um, and then I'll end the, my presentation with a couple of resources that are uh, geared towards Latino communities from our friends at AARP. And I'll close out with, um, we recently celebrated uh, Cesar Chavez Day. And uh, this is a quote that uh, we, we particularly um, think is really critical as we think about advancing health equity for the Latino community and other communities in California. A history will judge societies and governments and their institutions, not by how, how big they are or how well they serve the rich and the powerful, but by how effectively they respond to the needs of the poor and the helpless. Thank you very much and look forward to the Q&A. So thank you, Dr. Rino. So, so this is my honor to be here today with the California Department of Aging to present in this Equity in Aging webinar. Uh, my topic will be about building community and how can we create opportunities for and with Latinos. Uh, so hopefully we can do it in 15 minutes. That's the biggest challenge with so many things we have in mind, but mainly uh, I'm very proud to be part of the diversity, inclusion and equity a department inside the Alzheimer's Association. So I will be briefly presenting about uh, some needs assessments and a specific snapshot of Latino older adults all across the United States and California. And then I will dive into programs. Uh, mainly it's important when we penetrate the communities and when we are working with the communities, building communities that we have a strong a framework and best practices to be effective and to be sustainable. And hopefully we can have a discussion at the end with Q&A. Next one. So this is, a, when I was reviewing the information for this presentation, this is a qualitative study, not done in California, but in another state on the East Coast when there's an emerging a, a high number of Latino older adults and as part of a specific focus group with our community, these are the three main answers that Latino older adults mentioned. We are put off to one side. If I can't work, I can't survive. And without documents, you are no one. Next one. As Dr. Reynoso mentioned, we are now 15 million Latinos in California. So that will definitely impact health and social services in the near future and in the long run. And there's a very good report from National Council de la Raza, Unidos USA, uh, now about the demographic. Next one. Uh, so this is now focusing on what affects us as Latino older adults. Uh, to the left, we have a needs assessment conducted in Alameda County very recently as part of the plan in the county. And the three main topics that not only are affecting all uh, uh, seniors in the county, but the Latino older adults are isolation. And this was before the pandemic, economic insecurity and lack of affordable housing. So we begin to see that here, the, it pops up some social determinants of health. And to the right, this is a report from the National Hispanic Council of Aging that they conduct a multiple focus group across the country about what are the main issues that uh, Latinos face, Latino older adults face. And these were the answers, retirement security, healthy aging, housing, and access to services. Next one. Also, when we implement programs and when we build community with the Latino community, we have to be very careful, very sensitive, and always bring culture into all of the programs. And this is a very good article about cultural factors in preventing care, Latinos from 2002, that I would strongly suggest to review it because before addressing health disparities that affects the Latinos, they, they mention uh, seven very important traits in our culture is the family. We really 
belong to the family, who want to go to the family, to the doctor, who want to go to be with the family. Family is our support system that sometimes we are missing in the country. Also, personally, it's very important for us is really that face-to-face -face interaction more than an ATM, more than a phone, even more than a flyer. It's really how, with whom are we going to interact for programs. Sympathy and respect is very important. If there's an authority figure, figure always in our community. A paternalism, again, that respect of the mayor, respect of the priest, respect of the authorities. And also two import, one important one is the fatalism. Uh, I think we have to be conscious about the fatalism, what, I, what I'm going to do something if I'm going to die. So this is a really important matter and a really important topic when we address self-efficacy to try to promote change. Next one. This is also a result of the National Hispanic Council of Aging Focus Group 2016 all across the country. To the left uh, are the words most frequently uh, that came to mind to Latino older adults when they heard the word aging. So we related to health, loneliness, and also wisdom and experience. And to the right, uh, the biggest myth that pops in the minds of, in the mind of Latino older adults uh, when they were asked uh, this question, and it's really feeling useless, uh, some negative connotations, and really that end of life. Next one. So now here with programs, so when we build community and when we are going to penetrate the communities, as I mentioned, it's important to have the framework, uh, the health equity framework that Dr. Reynoso already mentioned, and it's really to the right, the traditional medical model. So it's really about mortality, epidemiology, risk factors, health education, et cetera, but definitely that's not addressing health disparities. So we are, everyone now is moving into the social determinant of health and how to approach institutional power and those disbalances and, especially, and also racism. And the important part of this is when we want to do effective and sustainable programs as because that we have to work not in the traditional way as a silos, but really between all sectors and with a strong collaboration. Uh, so to try to change that needle and to really try to transform a specific topic that the community needs. Next one. Uh, so we can dissect every social determinant of health that is affecting uh, Latinos. For example, 2015, a report from the National Council of La Raza in the USA mentioned that 20% of the Latinos are in poverty in California. And then if we see the statistic with Latino older adults in California, that practically goes to 40% of Latinos older adults in poverty. Next one. Also with programs, and when we are talking about uh, older adults, is the heterogeneity of the of our population. We know that health is not measured by the number of diseases, but really by its functional capacity. So this is like the 2080 approach. 80% of resources go into that 20% of older adults that are uh, frail or really dependent. But now we have to the left uh, also healthy uh, Latino older adults and healthy older adults that needs now to begin, that we need now to begin to uh, implement program. Next one. So this is the part. When we really get into the community, it's important to work with principle of primary care. And this is not the inventing the wheel, but this is really making very sure that we are working with different sectors, different institutions, and the basic concept is really the community participation. We cannot design programs with our community if we don't hear their voice and we don't hear the specific needs of the community. Also, we it's important to know about all the principles of health promotion. This is not something new. This is from 1980, 1990. There's the Jakarta Declaration, the Ottawa Charter that really set up a pace and, and explains what health promotion really is in our communities. And the basic component is to work with the community and unlock that potential of the communities. And to the right is a very practical approach when we work with the Spanish speaking communities about explaining what really we want to do and what the community has the power to do to, to do prevention. Next one. And in this one, I really want to take some time. I know that I still have five minutes to go, but this is really based on experience in Colombia, based on experience here in California for the last 20 years, and also reviewing the literature, literature when we are talking, working, and implementing program for Latinos. 
It's important to build that trust. We are putting our faith in our communities and we want to have that reputation and that trust so that we can really build uh, that rapport with the community. Bring culture into programs is very important and work around our culture when we're implementing programs. Also sustainability, we want to, we want to go to a community. It's not about a one year grant or even a two year grant. It's really how can we make sure that we have horizontal programs that are really working on needs and that has constant funding so that we can transform something in the community. And again, it's more than a survey or maybe more than an advisory committee, but it's really working on the needs of the community so that we can transform something at the personal or at the community level. And then to the right, uh, key principles. And this is like a recipe and some ingredients what we have to bring uh, in place. And one that I also recommend you to read more and to get more used to the popular education model. And I'm going to speak now later about the promotora de salud because it's really about informal education. People are eager to participate. People are eager to learn, but we have to bring down that university and that research uh, component into something very practical. We have to be more than really, truly cultural competent. We have to keep learning about the community, different ethnicities, bring the cultural humilities. It's an ongoing process of learning. And because even though as Latinos, we are diverse. So we can have Latinos in the Caribbean, in Central America, in South America. So we are even still learning on different subcultures of, of Latinos. And literacy is very important because it's not only a flyer, it's really how can we review, manage, and present the information so that the community can take action based on the information we are provided. And one key component in working with Latinos is uh, empowerment. I think we apply here principle of self-efficacy. Yes, we can do the change and really how can we grow as a person. Next one. So when reviewing the best practices, uh, there's uh, a lot of information now going on about healthy aging. And it was very interesting because I couldn't find a lot of best practices with Latino older adults and healthy aging. We can see a lot of other best practices with other communities, but this is a, uh, an area to develop. What we really encourage and what we really think is our very well kept secret in the Latino community is the community health workers model. Again, that's something that has been around for 30, 40 years all across the world. It has different names, more than 30 names can describe what a community health worker is. is Next one, but this is a key component of building our community, is the promotor de salud. Uh, we can call community health worker or health promoter, but it's really, this is the term that identifies and connects people in the community, promotor, promotor de la salud. And it's based on, on identifying those leaders in our communities and then bring them to discuss, to talk, to reflect, uh, to identify what are specific needs. The community have strong feelings when they really have an issue to solve. So it's really having that genuine dialogue and then the basic training. And then from there, designing programs, a bottom up so that they can feel embraced and motivated and empowered. And this has strong principle of Paulo Freire. In South America, this is very, very powerful powerful about what really moves the community. Uh, how can we make change and how can we keep growing? Uh, as Dr. Reynoso said, promoters are uh, leaders, agents of change. Uh, definitely we have to work with different competencies, different roles, different skills, but it's really a long-term coaching, one, two, three, four, five years to, 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 to develop and to engage them. Uh, there's every, robust evidence in California and in the United States is now a best practice. We don't need now to prove that it's an effective model in a community. Next one. And now to finish, uh, this is part also of that qualitative study uh, that attracted my, my sight when I was reviewing, because this is how we feel, uh, some of our family members feel uh, when we talk about Latino older adults. And this was the perspective from other participants, not Latinos. Older Latinos are not well served. Older Latinos are invisible. Older Latinos are undocumented and afraid. And older Latinos are wandering the highway 
there's some prejudice here because not all of the Latinos are undocumented, as Dr. Ring also said, just 20, 25%. So we are still 75% of documented Latinos in the United States. Next one. So finally, Latino older adults will challenge the traditional health and social services infrastructure and services. So this is good to have these dialogues and then to keep growing, learning, and implementing program for our community in California. Definitely we keep facing challenges in retirement, healthy aging, housing, and access to programs. And ideally uh, we need to address uh, upper stream measures, social determinants, otherwise we are not going to change the needle with health disparities. And we are eager to help. A different uh, publications and different studies have shown that we are Latinos want to help. We want to be part of the solution. We want to help the neighbor. We want to help our community. But it's how can we organize ourselves? Next one. A promotor de salud as a best practice to build community, to engage community, to transform people's life and transform communities. It's a lot of leadership development and advocacy and social network science. Mm. Next one. So we also have in the Alzheimer's Association, uh, part of my job is to engage the Latinos. So we are having in June 5th, the International Alzheimer's Symposium, completely in Spanish with UCSF. And also we have a weekly virtual coffee. This is a basic, basic activ activities to engage Latinos and then tackle uh, information on brain health and Alzheimer's. Next one. Next one. Next one. So I'm done. Thank you very much. Hopefully we can have the discussion. Hello. Thank you so much, Carlos and Dr. Reynoso. That was wonderful. I will go ahead and start my presentation. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today and to speak to you about this very important topic. I'm honored to be here and share the platform with my esteemed colleagues. Um, today's presentation, I will focus on the impact of health disparities in our, in our Latino community in Alzheimer's and healthcare settings, ensuring equity for all older Latinos. Best practices in working with the Latino community and sharing of community resources for more impactful programming. Next slide. So let's talk more about the makeup of California, as my colleagues have already mentioned. But Hispanics are the largest ethnically diverse population in California, making up to 39% of the state population. They're also one of the fastest growing aging populations in both the state of California and in the nation. Hispanic older adults over the age of 65 number over half a million and make up 7% of California's Latino population. And this number will continue to grow as the boomer generation grows. Next slide impact on health disparities in the older community. So despite decades of research and calls to action to ensure that healthcare is accessible and equity for all regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, geography, socioeconomic status, and this aim is still far from reality for way too many Americans. Disparities impacting health and healthcare reducing or eliminating disparity has been part of the national conversation is a key goal for the US Department of Health and Human Services Healthy People Initiative for over 20 years. Yet this disparity is still evident in health and health care. While health disparities and health care disparities are often used interchangeably, there are important distinctions between these two terms. Next slide. Disparity and health care disparities are two different uh, words here. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you go back up a slide? Oh. Yeah, I'm still talking on this slide. Sorry about that. So health disparity is a higher burden of illness, injury, disability, mortality experienced by one group relative to another. Healthcare disparity is the differences between groups and in healthcare insurance coverage, access to and the use of care and quality of care. So understanding how different racial and ethnic groups view access and experience healthcare is critical to informing improvements to the healthcare system, helping healthcare providers for increasing diverse population and to help develop meaningful and intentional programs. The need to do so is urgent. It is projected that people of color will account for over 39% of the population in the year 2050. 
According to the Alzheimer's Association special report, race, ethnicity, and Alzheimer's in America, racial and ethnic disparities exist in Alzheimer's and dementia care, where it is clear that communities of color, specifically 33% of Latinos report discrimination seeking health care. Next slide. So I also wanted to share with you that the Alzheimer's Association comes up with an annual report um, called Alzheimer's and Dementia Facts and Figures, produced by the association every single year. And one of the feature highlights here is that Hispanic Americans are about one and a half times more likely to have Alzheimer's and other dementias than whites. One in three seniors will die with Alzheimer's and other dementias. By the year 2050, the number of people 65 and older with Alzheimer's is projected to reach 12.7 million number. That's a huge number. In 2020, 690,000 people over the age of 65 and over are living with Alzheimer's. By the year 2025, which is in a few years, the number jumps to 840,000. That's an estimated 21.7% change increase. Next slide. So according to the recent findings from this special report, racial and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare, such as those observed during the pandemic, extend to dementia care. Stigma, cultural differences, awareness, understanding, and the ability to obtain a diagnosis, manage the disease, and access care and support services for dementia vary widely depending on race, ethnicity, geography, and social economic status. These disparities reach beyond clinical care to include uneven representation of Black, Hispanic, Asian, and Native Americans in Alzheimer's research in clinical trials. Health and social economic disparities and systematic racism contribute to an increased Alzheimer's and dementia risk in underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. Older Black and Hispanic Americans are also disproportionately more likely to have Alzheimer's and other dementias, as well as missed diagnosis than older white Americans. People of color want providers to understand their unique experiences and backgrounds, but many doubt that they will have access to culturally competent providers. An overwhelming majority of non-white Americans say it's important for Alzheimer's and dementia care providers to understand ethnic and racial background and experiences. Next slide. Bridging the racial and ethnic barriers in Alzheimer's care. Findings from this special report indicate that despite ongoing efforts to address health and healthcare disparities, there is still much more work to be done. Percentage of adults who have experienced racial or ethnic dis discrimination when seeking healthcare for Latinos feel that they are regularly discriminated. As you can see here on the graph, 6% say they are discriminated on a regular basis and 27% of the time from time to time. Current efforts to reduce health disparities, address social determinants of health, build diversity in healthcare profession and train healthcare providers to meet the needs of the growing population of older adults from different racial and ethnic backgrounds must be accelerated. Amid broad calls for social justice, greater strides must be made to eliminate discrimination and all forms of bias to ensure all Americans have access to high quality care and support services. Based on the survey findings, Preparing the workforce to care for a racially and ethnic diverse group of older adults, increasing diversity in dementia care, engaging, recruiting, retaining diverse populations in research and clinical trials. Next slide. So preparing the workforce to care for racially and ethnically diverse populations of older adults. Older Black and Hispanic Americans are more likely to have Alzheimer's and other dimensions than whites and this is likely due to the part of health and healthcare disparities. Coinciding with increasing diversity in the general population, the number of older Americans, particularly the oldest old, those 85 years and older, is also expected to grow. Up to 39% of this adult aging population, the adult population in 2050 will be people of color. Current and future healthcare providers need to prepare to screen, diagnose, treat Alzheimer's and dementia in this expanding racially and ethnically diverse population of older adults so that disparities are not perpetuated. Earlier reports on racial and ethnic differences, healthcare has been proposed cultural competence education as one solution to address disparities. Training providers to recognize and overcome 
Implicit bias is another method that organizations are using to tackle disparities. Cultural confidence at the organizational level helps build a diverse and inclusive workforce. At the provider level, cultural competence training equips professionals with the skills and resources needed to connect with dementia care recipients and caregivers across racial and ethnic groups in a way that is sensitive in cultural language. Next slide. Elements of a culturally competent workforce. A culturally competent work diverse staff that reflects the population served. Ability to overcome language barriers, either with bilingual staff or interpreters. Training for providers on the culture and languages represented in the population, patient materials and practice signage that are translated sensitive to the cultural norms. Next slide. So ways to engage your Latino community include efforts with local and national associations such as the National Council of La Raza, the Mexican Consulate, the Area Agency on Aging, the National Hispanic Council on Aging, just to name a few. But as uh, Carlos mentioned here earlier, um, what are the ways to engage Latinos? And the, one of the best practices is to engage your community health workers. So who is a community health worker? The American Public Health Association devised a community, defines a community health worker as a trusted member and or someone who has usually close understanding of the community served. This trusting relationship enables a worker to serve as a liaison or link between health and social services and the community to facilitate access to services and improve quality and cultural competence of service delivery. Next slide. Okay, so local best practices that we have here um, conducted here in San Diego, as you can see here, and um, trying to speed it up for time. Um, but we have locally uh, reached out to um, organizations that embrace the community health worker. Promotora or Promotora de Salud or Promotor um, are some of the um, words that we use to engage the promotoras and, and define promotoras. So what we try to do here in San Diego, and we have had key success here, is to really go for an organization and to have conversations with organizations that embrace this promotor model. That way we are able to make it a win-win with their current programmatic structure and with the core curriculum that your organization has to offer, can be able to expand the reach for many key community, key members in the community. Next slide. So here I just wanted to highlight a few um, or resources from the Alzheimer's Association. As you can see, this is our mission statement is to really leading the way to end Alzheimer's and all dementia by accelerating global research, driving risk reduction and early detection, and maximizing quality care and support. And also wanted to make sure that we all um, know that the Alzheimer's Association has an advocacy arm through the sister organization called AIM. And it works to ensure that needs of the persons with the disease and their care caregivers are heard at a local, state, federal level and has advocated for more funding annually through the NIH. Also to engage more Latinos and more people of color in clinical trials, which is very much needed. Um, we can be able to reach our trial match through this link as stated here. And the next slide. So the Alzheimer's Association special report just came out about two weeks ago. So it's titled Race, Ethnicity and Alzheimer's in America, which examines the perspectives and experiences of Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native and White Americans in regards to Alzheimer's and dementia care. care. And here is a link here for more information. Uh, all of my citations from this report are indicated in this report. Also, next slide. I wanted to also highlight um, the National Hispanic Council of Aging, NACOA, and the AARP, also great resources for you to try to expand your programming efforts to include programming for specifically older adults and the Latino community at large. Also one of the greatest resources here on the next slide, here we go, training and continuing education about healthy aging for community health workers. Here highlighted are a couple of great resources you can be able to also uh, seek out and expand your, um, your efforts and your structural programming so that we can be more inclusive of this population. 
and also making sure that you connect with your local public health department as there is a great initiative here on healthy living and brain, healthy brain initiative. And I encourage you to take a look at that. And um, they're always looking for people to engage with their current programming so we can be able to expand great efforts into the Latino community. Next slide. Okay, here we go. Here's my contact information. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you all so much, uh, Dr. Reynoso, Anna Carlos. That was a fantastic presentation with lots of practical takeaways that I hope our guests found helpful. Uh, we do have questions coming into the Q&A box. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and use the raise hand feature, or if you're dialing in, press star nine, and that will put you in the queue. Um, so we'll start with a question from Linda who, uh, I guess this is maybe for all of you, um, she'd like to hear more about what older Latinos face in terms of retirement income and Medicare. Um, what should we know and anticipate about economic security of older Latinos? Does anybody want to take that one on? Sure, I can maybe start and my colleagues can fill in uh, any gaps. Uh, so these federal programs at a federal level, there continue to be challenges for Latinos, particularly uh, with uh, Latino seniors who are undocumented. Uh, a lot of these programs, Medicare, um, Social Security um, are only available for those who are legally permanent residents. Uh, I believe Medicare, uh, there is a a time requirement if you're a green card holder um, to access those benefits. So it continues to be a challenge. And, and unless the, the Congress passes uh, some type of immigration reform, that'll continue to be a challenge in California, uh, particularly around the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic impacts on communities of color. Uh, we were the hardest hit um, with, uh, with the pandemic and the first stimulus bill, it, explicitly excluded undocumented immigrants uh, from any of those uh, stimulus check uh, payments. The state of California took a different approach uh, and established the Immigrant Resilience Fund, which was a $75 million state investment with a $75 million uh, philanthropic match. So it was a public private partnership uh, for uh, undocumented immigrants within the, the state of California. And so uh, it continues to be in challenge. I mentioned health for all seniors. Uh, for the lowest income seniors uh, among, among our community members, uh, we are actively um, having those conversations uh, in the state of California to think about how do we expand coverage under the state's Medi-Cal program uh, with, within the state. Obviously, that, that doesn't cover Medicare, uh, but it continues to be a huge challenge. I mean, economic, uh, economic opportunity and developing economic pathways for opportunity continue to be a challenge for the Latino community. But I think within the state of California, we're thinking through some at least policy strategies and some programmatic strategies to, to address uh, this inequity. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I, I don't know, Carlos, if you wanted to add something to that. I saw you had your camera on. No, it's okay, Dr. Reynoso did it very well. Thank you, Dr. Covered, okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, a question about the Latino virtual coffee meetings. Um, how can people join? Is there a way to sign up? So I cannot open my video, but let me. So yes, it was, it's, it's very interesting. Thank you for that question because when the pandemic hit us, all of us, we had to, we have to learn technology. We have to get to speed. So we began talking with our volunteers, community leaders, and promotores de salud all across our counties and the Bay Area. And we decided to meet every Friday to learn about technology. That was, and then to cope with the pandemic, then to give us support as a community. As I mentioned, we like the social networking. So if we couldn't do it in the front lines in person, we did it virtual. So we learn, we keep learning. Then we began talking about health, culture, mental health, the pressing things that were hitting us last year in the pandemic, and it has grown. Now we have 150 people registered, and we met every Friday from 11 to 12 uh, via Zoom uh, to talk about different aspects. So I will be more than glad to put uh, in the chat the, 
registration link and everyone is welcome. Fantastic, thank you, Carlos. Um, I think there was a question uh, about uh, the stimulus. Um, so just clarifying, if undocumented immigrants have an ITIN or uh, ITIN, can they qualify for the stimulus? Jeffrey, I see that you might be interested in answering that one. Sure, I can take that on. Great question. So for ITIN filers, um, I should have um, clarified in, in my previous response. The first stimulus check, uh, if you were an ITIN filer and you were in a mixed status household, you were excluded. But the second and third, um, if you're in a mixed status family, um, you are eligible. Um, it gets a little bit complicated, but I'll share a link uh, in the chat box with some more information. Thank you so much, Dr. Reno. So, and at this time, I'm not seeing any additional questions or comments. So I'll just pause for a couple of seconds to see if anybody wants to jump in. Okay, and I'll turn it back over to Connie Nakano to uh, share some closing remarks. Thank you, Mariah. And thank you to all the speakers. Um, your presentations were great and very insightful. So thank you again. Um, thank you everyone for attending. We hope that you found this webinar um, insightful as well and educational. Um, just some quick reminders, um, visit CDA's Aging and Equity Resources for more information. We have some links in our Equity and Aging Resource Center um, and also information about our California for All Ages campaign. You can also check out the Alzheimer's Association 2021 Facts and Figures Report. We'll have a link available for that as well. And also uh, register in advance for our May 5th uh, webinar. It's, the topic will be culturally informed policy and programs with and for older adults with Alzheimer's and other dementias. Today's webinar recording, slides and transcripts will also be available online in our Equity and Aging Resource Center and also our YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to access all the information and also all the links as well. If you have any additional questions, feel free to send it to engage at aging.ca.gov. That's engage at aging.ca.gov. And we thank you everyone for attending. This concludes our webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.